Hello, welcome everyone to this course on Fourier Analysis and Applications. And this is a course that is very popular among undergraduate students. No doubt you have seen vestiges of Fourier series in your undergraduate curriculum, particularly while solving boundary value problems for various partial differential equations, particularly the Laplace's equation, the heat equation and the wave equation. So you solve the Laplace's equation on a circle, on a disk, or the wave equation on a square, etc. And the technique is very routine. You try to expand the function <coughs> as a Fourier series. A fairly general function f of x, uh, you try to write it as a infinite superposition of sines and cosines, namely f of x equal to a naught plus summation n from 1 to infinity a n cos n x plus b n sin n x the displayed equation 1.1 on the slide. Before we plunge into the theory behind these kinds of expansions, the Fourier expansions, let us trace back to the early genesis of this theory of Fourier series. So let us look at certain early trials and a little history. It always helps to start a course with a little historical background as to how it all began. A very important historical source from which I learned some of these things is this book of Ivor uh, Grattan Guinness, Convolutions in French Mathematics, 1800 to 1840, volume 2. This is in three volumes. The second volume is what we are talking about, the turns. The, uh, the book was published by Burkhauser in 1990. Let us look at a few aspects during the nascent stages of the development of Fourier analysis. The page numbers refer to this book of Grattan Guinness. Attempts at expressing a fairly general function f of x as a series of the form 1.1 that we just saw predate Fourier by at least 50 years, about half a century, in the works of Daniel Bernoulli and Leonard Euler. Again, in connection with physical problems about vibrations and, and, and such. The perplexing issue was the following. How can a series of 2 pi periodic functions, all these functions sin x, sin 2x, sin 3x, cos x, cos 2x, cos 3x, they are all 2 pi periodic smooth functions on the real line. How can a, a superposition of such 2 pi periodic functions produce in ge a general a priori non-periodic function. This problem seems to have languished in this state of affairs until the time of Fourier. Fourier's researches were persuasive in advocating the method of separation of variables, so commonly found today in modern undergraduate courses in PDEs. The method of separation of variables and the idea of using Fourier series uh, of the expansions in terms of sines and cosines was not popular in as much as the solution presents itself in a form in which the boundary conditions remain masked in the coefficients of the expansion. Remember, what do you do? When you write this method of separation of variables, you get the solution as an infinite series and the, and the coefficients are, uh, are determined using the initial conditions or the boundary conditions, etc. So the side conditions that you have when you solve a PD, they get incorporated and it is these coefficients of the sines and cosines that encode this information about the boundary data. So that's what I, I, that's what it means when I write that the solutions present themselves in a form in which the boundary conditions remain masked in the coefficients of the expansion 1.1, the so ANs and the BNs. In contrast, the functional form was preferred, such as the Poisson's integral representation for solutions of the Laplace's equation of D'Alembert's solution of the wave equation in one space dimension. There you see the solutions written as integrals and the integrals involve directly the boundary condition or the initial conditions. <clears throat> 
Fourier also obtained interesting series expansions such as the one displayed in equation 1.2 in the slide that you see. Here you see the number pi by 4 has been written as a series of cosines and this is valid in the interval 0 to pi. Of course Fourier was well aware of the convergence issues, there are subtle issues <clears throat> And he established rigorously the convergence of this equation uh, of the series that appears in 1.2. And likewise, issues pertaining to completeness also cropped up. Besides trigonometric functions, Fourier also employed Bessel's functions in the summons of his series. This point was acknowledged by Lommel and Heiner. Lommel and Heiner were two significant contributors to the theory of Bessel's functions, and this use of Bessel's functions by Fourier was acknowledged by Lommel and Heiner proposed the name Fourier-Bessel's expansions for these. Now let us go to, to the researches of Legion Dirichlet, Jordan and Paul Dubois Raymond. The first significant step towards the general convergence theorem is due to Dirichlet in 1829. So what did Dirichlet do? Dirichlet proved the first pointwise convergence theorem. So for what kind of functions did Dirichlet prove the theorem of pointwise convergence? He took functions which are piecewise continuous and monotone. So you take the interval minus, minus pi to pi, you chop it up into finitely many pieces and the function is continuous on each piece and it is monotone on each piece. At the junction of uh, between two intervals, the function could have a jump discontinuity. So you could have a function which is defined piecewise and each piece is monotone. The pieces may not join up continuously. <clears throat> At points of continuity, the Fourier is, the series converges to the function f of x. At points of discontinuity, the series converges to the arithmetic mean. We shall prove this th theorem of Dirichlet rigorously at a later point in the course. We will need some preparations such as the mean value theorem for integrals due to Bonnet. <clears throat> Dirichlet was of the view that the failure of pointwise convergence would stem from some lack of integrability of the function f whose expansion is being sought. Jordan generalized the results of Dirichlet to include functions of bounded variations. We shall discuss later in detail what uh, functions of bounded variations mean and we shall give the precise definitions later. In the year 1873, Paul Dubois Raymond produced an example of a continuous function whose Fourier series failed to converge. So even continuity of the function does not guarantee the convergence of the Fourier series. This is a very important point to be kept in mind. Continuity alone doesn't suffice. And I've given a reference to a book by Kahane and others. I've not listed all the three authors. The complete reference will be available in a few slides to follow. Let us look at some 20th century milestone. In 1926, A.N. Kolmogorov found a function in L1. L1 is the Lebesgue space. L1, L2, Lp, these are the space of functions which are Lebesgue integrable on the closed interval minus pi pi. So Kolmogorov found a function which is integrable, which is Lebesgue integrable on minus pi pi, whose Fourier series diverges everywhere. And N.N. Luzin conjectured that the Fourier series of a function in L2 must converge pointwise almost everywhere. In particular, if you take a continuous function from minus pi to pi, a continuous function is in L2, right? A continuous function from minus pi to pi is obviously in L2. So, although Dubois Raymond established that the Fourier series of a continuous function uh, may diverge, it must converge almost everywhere. That is a that is a set of places where the Fourier series diverges has set of measure 0. The conjecture of Luzin was finally settled decades later by Leonard Carlson. It's a, it is a monumental achievement. Later, it was generalized by Hunt for LP functions where P is strictly bigger than 1. 
these are some of the 20th century milestones. Let's move a little further and let us see after Dirichlet, we, in fact, there is a bit of an anachronism. We are going back to the 19th century here. We are going back to Bernard Riemann. After Dirichlet, the study of Fourier series was significantly furthered by Bernard Riemann in his Habilitation Schrift, which he wrote in 1854. In 1859, there appeared his epoch-making memoir on the distribution of primes and the Riemann zeta function, where he gives a proof of the famous functional equation that bears his name. And he gives two proofs, in fact, for the functional equation and one of them uses Fourier analysis. Basically, what he does is that he derives the theta function identity of Jacobi and he uses the, he, via the Mellin transform, the theta function identity goes over to the functional equation for the zeta function. <coughs> and the theta function identity itself can be established via Fourier methods. Namely, you solve the heat equation in two ways using Fourier series and Fourier transforms and you compare the results invoking some uniqueness theorem for the initial value problem for the heat equation with periodic initial conditions. <coughs> The theta function identity is, uh, as I said, is related to the functional equation of the zeta function. Of course, <coughs> Riemann's memoir opened up, as we know, come a new vista in the theory of analytic number theory. The pervasive nature of Fourier analysis, the theory of Fourier series and Fourier transforms has been profoundly generalized and its use extends far beyond the purpose for which it was originally invented, namely for solving partial differential equations. Today, Fourier analysis is an indispensable tool in several diverse areas of mathematics such as probability theory, number theory, uh, geometry, to name a few. Besides the book of Grattan Guinness, the authoritative account of Kahane and Lemaire uh, ought to be consulted for any serious understanding of the historical developments of the subject. Chapter 3 of this book of Kahane and, and Lemaire is devoted to the work of Riemann. The discussion of Riemann's work can be found in this particular in chapter 3 of this book. Let us now look at the impact of Fourier analysis in the late 19th and early 20th century mathematics. Fourier analysis provided much impetus for the development of point set topology as well as the development of measure theory. In fact, the significant researches of Georg Cantor in set topology in the late 19th century and early 20th century was due to his interest in problems originating in Fourier analysis. There are two references for this that are very important. One is by A. Kacheris set theory and the uniqueness of trigonometric series. And this a reading of this would be an excellent project for a student at the master's level. The second reference that I would like to point out is Roger Cook's beautiful article, a somewhat lengthy article, but a very, very comprehensive article on the uniqueness of Fourier series and descriptive set theory. And he spans more than a century, 1870 to 1985. It appeared in 1993 in the archive of the history of exact sciences. And let us uh, begin uh, with, the, with the first chapter, the basic notions. Let us go through the plan of the chapter. In this chapter, we focus on the following. We look at a class of two pi periodic functions on the real line. There are Lipschitz continuous and Holder continuous of exponent alpha. Now, by the way, these words which appear in blue are, are new concepts and concepts and uh, like Lipschitz continuity, Holder continuity, Riemann, Lebesgue lemma, they will be highlighted in blue and names of references will be highlighted in purple. So, Lipschitz continuous functions and Holder continuous functions, they will be defined later. <coughs> we prove a fundamental theorem called the riemann lebesgue lemma for functions in L1. The riemann lebesgue lemma says that if you take a function which is in L1, then the Fourier coefficients will decay to 0 as n goes to infinity. This is a very important step 
in the proof of the convergence theorem. Then we will derive an expression for the so called Dirichlet kernel and the behavior of the Dirichlet kernel is extremely important with regard to the convergence of the Fourier series. We must examine the nature of the singularity of the Dirichlet kernel. The Dirichlet kernel is an oscillatory kernel, it is a, it's a, it's a highly, highly oscillatory function near the origin and it is these oscillations and the, and the mutual cancellations that are, that are to be uh, studied very carefully. And we will also try to understand the, the obstacle to proving pointwise convergence. When the function is merely assumed to be continuous and nothing more, the argument breaks down. Whereas if you have a little extra regularity such as Holder continuity or Lipschitz continuity, then we can prove the convergence theorem. The singularity in the Dirichlet kernel is, is to, to some extent destroyed by this Holder continuity or Lipschitz continuity or whatever. Let us look at a simple exa example of Lipschitz continuous function. What is the Lipschitz continuous function? Let us recall a function is said to be Lipschitz continuous if mod fx minus fy is less than or equal to L times mod x minus y. Formal definition will come later. I will just, I'll, I'll just speak the definition out. In a later slide, we will put it down. It will appear explicitly. So, you have probably encountered Lipschitz continuity in your courses, particularly in your course on ordinary differential equations where we prove ex existence uniqueness under a Lipschitz condition, under a Lipschitz hypothesis. So, one of the popular conditions to impose on the function is Lipschitz continuity. So, let us look at a simple example of a Lipschitz continuous function. Take cos Ax on the interval minus pi pi. It is a smooth function on the, uh, on the interval minus pi pi and it is an even function. Being an even function, it takes the same value at minus pi and pi. So, what I do is I simply take the 2 pi periodic extension. The 2 pi periodic extension is just a bunch of arches, one following the other. But at the, at the, at the junction from minus pi to pi and from pi to 2 pi, at the point pi, this extension will not be differentiable, but it will be holder continuous. It will be in fact, it will be even be Lipschitz continuous. So, so, the 2 pi periodic extension of cos Ax is an example of a Holder continuous function. So, the basic convergence theorem that we prove will hold for this cos Ax. So, if you take this function cos Ax and write the Fourier series for that, we are going to get this expression. We are going to derive all these things later. Just I am just giving you a sneak preview of what is going to come. Cos Ax is when you write it as a Fourier series, the constant term is sin pi a upon pi a. Since cos Ax is an even function, in the Fourier series will only contain even, even functions. So, the sin Nx term will not be there at all. What are the coefficient of cos Nx? You see displayed out there minus 1 to the power n upon a squared minus n squared and there is a common 2a sin a pi upon pi for all the terms that has been pulled out of the summation sign. So, here is a Fourier series for cos Ax and this is going to be true for all values of x because cos Ax is the 2 pi periodic extension of cos Ax is Lipschitz continuous on the entire real line. So, I am allowed to put whatever value of x I want and this equation will be valid. So, let us put x equal to 0, put x equal to 0 left hand side becomes 1. And the right hand side instead of cos nx I simply get minus 1 to the power n upon a squared minus n squared. And a little rearrangement will give you this partial fraction expansion or the metag leffler expansion for cosecant pi a. The, the, the partial fraction decomposition for the cosecant can be derived using Fourier series and you see it displayed cosecant pi a equal to 1 upon pi a plus 2 a by pi summation n from 1 to infinity minus 1 to the power n upon a squared minus n squared. Similar expansions for cotangent and other things can also be derived using just the basic convergence theorem. We prove the basic convergence theorem and these are some of the corollaries that we can derive. So, it, it gives back some very beautiful formulas in classical analysis. 
Using these expansions, using these Mittag-Leffler expansions, we can find, for instance, special values of the zeta function. We shall discuss the special case of the Poisson summation formula for the, uh, using the Gaussian. We take the Gaussian and we use the Gaussian to cook up a 2 pi periodic function, determine the Fourier series and we will derive a special case of the Poisson summation formula and we will also derive the Jacobi theta function identity. As mentioned earlier, this is equivalent to Riemann's functional equation for the zeta function. We will also discuss the Bernoulli numbers and we will obtain a generating function for the Bernoulli numbers and we shall get special values of zeta functions. We close the chapter with a discussion of the generating function for the Bessel's function of the first kind. We will, we will recall what the Bessel's functions are using ordinary differential equations. So there will be a slight bit of digression to get the requisite Bessel's function identities, recursion formulas for the Bessel's function and these Bessel's functions will be embedded into a power series and the generating function will be determined in closed form using Fourier analysis. And later, in a later chapter, we will use these in, a, uh, in an application to a problem in celestial mechanics. Now this concludes the uh, a historical sketch of the early genesis of Fourier analysis and also the plan of the first chapter that we shall be studying. So now let us formally begin the chapter 1, the basic convergence theorem. So to set the stage, let us begin with a 2 pi periodic function f from r to r which at present is quite arbitrary except that over the interval minus pi to pi the integral exists. Now it is extremely important to use the Lebesgue integrals in our discussion. It is not convenient to use Riemann integration. The space we want spaces that are complete. Cauchy sequences must converge. So L2 for example, so we must work with L2 of minus pi pi in a later chapter. So Lebesgue integrals are absolute must. So Lebesgue theory is a must. So for technical reasons, we must use Lebesgue integrals. So, so we assume that the function f is integrable in the sense of Lebesgue on the interval minus pi pi. As explained earlier, the objective is to express f as an infinite series f of x equal to a naught plus summation n from 1 to infinity a n cos n x plus b n sin n x. A series of the form 1.1 is called a trigonometric series. The fundamental question of course is regarding the meaning of the equality in 1.1. For instance, in what sense does the series in 1.1 converge? The series can converge in a variety of ways. Already you know in your undergraduate courses, you can talk about pointwise convergence, you can talk about uniform convergence. You know that uniform convergence is very strong, pointwise convergence is very weak. To, to list some of the alternatives, let us look at what are the other modes in which 1.1 can converge. So first, let us add the first 2n plus 1 terms of the series. I said 2n plus 1 because there will be cos and there is a sine and there is a constant term. So I will take n cosines, n sines and the constant. So a naught plus summation aj cos jx plus bj sin jx, j from 1 to n. So I take the first n terms involving the cosine, the first n terms involving the sine and the constant term. So Sn Sn of f of x is the nth partial sum of the series, but this nth partial sum really is a sum of 2n plus 1 terms. I am going to call it the nth partial sum just for convenience. So we say that the series converges to f of x pointwise almost everywhere if this partial sum Sn fx converges to fx as n tends to infinity for all x except on a set of measure 0. We say that the series f 1.1 uh, converges to fx in mean if the difference Sn fx minus fx the norm, the L2 norm 
converges to 0. That is, if the sequence Sn converges to F in L2. The third form of convergence is Cesaro convergence. That you take S1x, S2x, Snx, you take, uh, and then you take the arithmetic means of these partial sums. The arithmetic means of these partial sums must converge to Fx. These are the three important modes of convergence that one can think about. One can also talk about distributional convergence, convergence in the sense of distributions. One can also try to include that, but for that you need to develop the theory of distributions. I do not think you have studied distribution theory in your earlier courses. You have you for sure studied pointwise convergence, you also studied mean convergence uh, or if you are an engineer, you would have encountered this so called RMS, root mean squared. If they integrate from minus pi to pi mod gx squared dx and you normally put a 1 upon 2 pi to make it an average value and then you take the square root. So that dimensionally everything is correct. So it is an RMS, in, in engi electrical engineering you will call it the convergence in RMS convergence, root mean squared. And the third is Cesaro convergence. These three modes of convergence are going to be extremely important. We are going to devote a whole chapter to mean convergence and we are going to devote an entire chapter to Cesaro convergence. And Cesaro convergence will give us a very important theorem on Weyl's equidistribution theory. So we shall need, of course, we are not going to get these for free. The F must satisfy additional hypothesis before we can get any of these things. For, for the mean convergence, we will need that F must be in L2. For pointwise convergence, we are going to assume that the function is Holder continuous to exponent alpha or Lipschitz continuous or something. Or we could assume that the function is piecewise continuous and monotone. That is Dirichlet's theorem. So, Cesaro convergence, for example, if f is continuous, just continuity, then we know from Paul Dubois Raymond's example that pointwise convergence fails, but Cesaro convergence will happen. But not only that, Cesaro convergence will happen very strongly. If f of x is continuous, then these Cesaro means actually converge uniformly. It is far better, we get something much, much better. So there are, there is a trade-off. Sometimes we need additional hypothesis. If you want pointwise convergence, we need better than continuity like Lipschitz continuity, Holder continuity, monotonosity, piecewise monotonosity. Mean convergence is easy. We just need f should be in L2 and the Cesaro convergence, it is not pointwise convergence, it is convergence of arithmetic means, f is just assumed to be continuous, but the Cesaro means give you uniform convergence. Why does this happen? We will understand this better. When we average the Dirichlet kernel, it improves, we get what is called as a Feyer kernel. The last thing that I talked about is known as a Feyer's theorem, we will we'll have a whole chapter on this Cesaro convergence. I think this is a very good place to stop this particular module and I think I will stop here and we will continue this in the next module, we will we'll derive things and we will develop the theory further. So thank you very much and goodbye.